Funding for This Is Nashville comes from you, our listeners, and Music City Prep Clinic, Nashville-based provider for prep and offering comprehensive sexual health services in an environment designed to be safe, professional, and shame-free. Learn more at musiccityprep.org. I'm Khalil E. Colonna, and this is Nashville. It was today, about 60 years ago, when 10 Nashville women and men risked it all to join the Freedom Riders on an interstate bus. Next stop, Birmingham, Alabama. The ride started in Washington, D.C., as civil rights activists embarked on their journey to enforce integration on interstate buses and at bus stations. In the civil rights movement of the 1950s and 60s, Nashville was home to many of the movements we now think of as iconic. Later this hour, we'll take a look back at that history and dive into the stories of the Nashville Freedom Riders and meet one local activist who was at the very heart of the civil rights movement here. But first, ever since devastating floods hit the small town of Waverly, Tennessee, back in August, WPLN News has been keeping up with the community as recovery continues. It's often the case that the news crews swoop into smaller, more rural areas when disaster strikes, and then they leave. We wanted to keep this relationship going, to get to know the people that make up this town and what recovery really looks like. WPLN reporter Damon Mitchell has was just in Waverly yesterday, and he joins me now. Damon, welcome back. How's it going, Khalil? Doing all right, my friend. How are you? Good. So, okay, so there was a pretty big event in town last night near the end of the school year. Tell us about it. So uh, Waverly seniors will be graduating Friday, um, and yesterday was kind of like a a pre-graduation walk um, at the elementary and the junior high schools, were, which were flooded. Traditionally, the students would kind of walk through the halls of the elementary school, and kind of the kids would like give them high fives. But of uh, it's it's been unoccupied since the flood, so they wanted to do like a. Um, essentially like a a way to say goodbye to the school. Um, They are trying to relocate the buildings now. So this is essentially like the last moment they'll have to kind of be in that space. Congratulations to the class of 2022. Tell me, what did you see? What was the energy there? Um, Really like the energy matched like the sun that was out yesterday. Um, Mm -hmm. There was some music out. Um, A lot of parents, community members came um teachers and teachers showed up there i met a really fun and, and funny teacher who she was a pe teacher like everybody loves a pe teacher yeah. um i know i love mine and i, I hated school hey uh, but, i agree with you pe pe art and recess were my favorite classes yeah um but she um she like led the walk um so that was that was kind of a, a fun thing but yeah just family friends um teachers and community is the community planning anything particularly different for this year's graduation ceremonies um i wouldn't say that it's um anything necessarily different but of course the it'll probably be a much different mood um because of the flood um but so i I imagine it would be different in the sense that maybe how people are feeling um what it means to them things like that so you met Marilyn Phillips, the retired PE teacher that we were both so fond of. Um, she led several dozen of the high school seniors on their graduation walk outside the floor damaged schools. Let's take a listen. It's just surreal, really. It's just hard to think that we're going to drive by here and it won't be here. It's, uh, you know, for, for people who taught here, this, this was our home for all this time. And it's going to be like a lot of the other homes in Waverly. It won't be standing here anymore. But you know what? This is a strong community, and we'll survive. And we will make happy memories, and we'll have kids starting other schools, and there'll be graduations, and there'll be weddings, and, you know, we'll just continue to be here. Marilyn Phillips has literally watched this town grow up. What did yesterday's event really mean to her? Um, she she did get emotional. I think you can kind of hear that in the tape a little bit. Um, like she told me there were, she was like, I, I taught everybody here and like some of them, like they have mustaches now and they're mm. taller than me. So I had to like look them in the eyes, but I, I felt that connection once I did that. Um, 
But she's essentially like if you live in Waverly is a, a super small town. So if you were born and raised there you, and you are younger than her, you probably um, were was in a class of hers. And she mentioned that she taught some of the kids that, were gradu- that are graduating parents mm-hmm. and even some of their parents' parents. Um, so a very emotional time for her. And then the, the school that she spent so much time in will no longer be there in the future. Um so yeah, very, a very emotional but exciting moment for her. Yeah, that sound that, that's really awesome. I was an educator, and to see that some of my students are grown people with kids of their own, it's really just a remarkable feeling. And the fact that she did that for yeah. multiple generations is even more amazing. Now, the the last time you were on the show, you talked, and we talked about Waverly. You spoke with Gretchen Turner and her daughter Zoe, who is a senior. Did you have a chance to run into either one of them and talk? Yeah, I, I did see them, and actually beforehand, I, um, I'm doing kind of a separate project with um, Zoe, and I, I got a chance to interview her just to kind of talk about her just year and and what she's looking for forward to after graduation, and she'll actually be going to UTK. Um, I want to say, yeah, move in this is this summer. Okay, so how is she feeling about graduating? Um, so Zoe is very. She's probably the hardest person I've ever interviewed. Um, she's just, she's just very kind of conservative, um, and she gives you like just enough. Uh, mm-hmm. But I, I felt like she she felt excited just to kind of get out of the her parents' home and get to explore more of the world. Uh, she's been in this small town. She actually her brother is in Knoxville as well in okay. grad school at UTK. Um, so she was just kind of. Just really excited to get out there and and see what else is in the world. What about Gretchen? How's she feeling? Um, good. I think there is some sadness like this. Um, the the last kid is leaving the house. Um, but she early on when I spoke with Gretchen, she contemplated maybe moving to Knoxville mm-hmm. um, with her two kids since they were both going to be there, but um, she's just like so connected to the town and literally I. I told you this before, but she's literally like a local celebrity and everybody that I've met in Waverly has been pretty much because of her. Um, so I think there's some sadness about Zoe leaving her last kid leaving, but also she's also kind of spearheading a lot of things as far as recovery. So I think there's also just a lot of hope and excitement to see where Waverly goes next. It's really interesting, her reaction to having an empty nest. I think my mom, actually, I know my mother threw a party uh, as soon as my my youngest sister left for college. As you know, we we mentioned that you're keeping up with this town since August and you just talked about recovery a little bit. So what stood out to you on your visit as you saw the recovery efforts? Um, So just kind of walking down and so the the schools, the graduation, the elementary and junior high schools are in the same block. as Gretchen and, and a lot of other people that I've met, but just walking down the the street, um, I saw a lot of people in their homes. There were people on porches, um, kind of doing yard work. So you can definitely tell that people are moving back in. Um, there are some areas where um, there's still you can still see the flood damage. I, I interviewed a guy while I was there, and um, literally his houses like they have to rebuild the whole thing um so you see kind of the construction materials out um so there is a lot of work to be done but you can also see the progress that is wpln reporter damon mitchell damon thanks for being here thanks we have to take a short break when we come back we'll hear from the nashville freedom riders and a few local poets who were inspired by their stories What stories do you have about the Freedom Riders? Tweet us at This Is Nashville. We'll be right back. Funding for This Is Nashville comes from you, our listeners, and Music City Prep Clinic, Nashville-based provider for prep and offering comprehensive sexual health services in an environment designed to be safe, professional, and shame-free. Learn more at musiccityprep.org. I'm Khalil Colonna, and this is Nashville. Picture the scene. 
It's May 1961, and you've just heard about a group of black and white students traveling by bus to Alabama, trying to challenge the vice of segregation and getting mobbed by the KKK. Would you volunteer to go next? For some college students in Nashville, the answer was yes. The late Rip Patton remembers the story of how that journey began. We figured that our phones were tapped here in Nashville because about two something in the morning, John Siegenthaler, who was sent by Bobby Kennedy to get CORE out of Birmingham, get him on a plane to New Orleans and then back to Washington, D.C., was in his hotel room. Uh, he said that he was in his hotel room feeling good because he did what the President of the United States and the Attorney General told him to do, and he was very successful with that. So his phone rings, and it's Bobby Kennedy. And Bobby Kennedy said, who in the hell is Diane Nash? Call her and tell her not to send those students down on a freedom ride. So he calls her and he's pleading with her and, and she said to him, sir, we know that somebody's going to die, but we're not going to let uh, violence overrule nonviolence. Our first group has left Nashville already. You're a little bit too late. On this day, May 17th, 1961, a group of black college students left Nashville for Birmingham to join the Freedom Ride. My first guest, Joshua Moore, is the producer and host of Nashville Public Radio podcast, Versify. In its 2020 season, the local poets interviewed four Nashville Freedom Riders and then wrote poems based on their stories. Joshua, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. So you grew up in Nashville. What did you learn about the Freedom Riders growing up? You know, you hate to say it, but frankly, next to nothing. Mm. Yeah, there was not, you know, I took advanced history courses in high school and there wasn't a ton of focus on kind of localized history or state history. But even when there was, um, it was not a story that if there was, it was like a footnote, to, uh, you know, the larger narratives of the civil rights movement. I didn't know in any way how pivotal of a role they played. So what surprised you as you were working on this project? What did you figure out? Um, I think what surprised me is how pervasive um, the efforts were, like how much of the community was involved at different levels and the ways in which um, beyond the students themselves, like their support systems, though they might not have been overtly out marching with them, were working behind the scenes to really kind of like put their, you know, put their back behind the movement. Some of them selling off property, some of them like representing them pro bono. Um, you know, in the case, many people are familiar with the story of Z. Alexander Luby's house being bombed, but he was a representative for the students in the sit in the sit-ins. And so like all of the network of people who kind of undergirded them to make their work possible. Um, it was stunning. You know, the interviews you all did for each episode really gave these complex stories a chance to breathe. In one episode, Rip Patton explains how the Nashville students ended up in Jackson, Mississippi, were arrested and sent to Parchman Penitentiary. So there were over 300 and something like 325 of us in Parchman. And we never got outside. The whole time we were there, we were inside in our cell block and in our jail cells. And of course the guards, would, we would sing. Again, we announced our presence through our songs. And we would sing songs and the guards didn't like that. And so, well, uh, the only thing they could do was to take something away from us. For example, a mattress. This mattress was probably an inch thick on a steel bunk bed. And so they, if you don't stop that singing, we're going to take your mattress away. Okay, open the door. They'd open the door and we'd throw our mattresses out in the hallway. You can take our mattress. Oh, yes. You can take our mattress. Oh, yes. You can take our mattress. You can take our mattress. You can take our mattress. Oh, yes. So they would do different things to us, even the food. They would put stool softener in the food, and you're sitting in there. They turn the heat on in Mississippi in the summer during the day, air conditioner on at night, and turn the water off so that you could not flush the toilet that was in your uh, the commode. And you and your cellmate, you know, trying to make decisions who's going to go first. <laughs> All these different things. But, uh, you know, we were there for a purpose. My next guest is Destiny Birdsong, who interviewed Nashville freedom writer, Dr. Rip Patton. Destiny, what was it like hearing his story in person? 
It was life changing for me. I feel like I heard it at the exact time I needed to. I was undergoing some really drastic life changes and to hear about the resolve of of these, you know, teenagers and young adults like fighting against this this overwhelming um racism and these structures of power that you know even invaded their bodies like you just played the clip of him talking about the stool softener um it really changed how I thought about myself it changed how I thought about the black people who came before me and it changed how I thought about the power of um you know nonviolent resolve mm. um, yeah Unfortunately, Dr. Patton passed away last September, and I never had the pleasure of meeting him. So Destiny, tell me, what was he really like? <laughs> he was wonderful. Um, he was very kind. He was incredibly knowledgeable. He was a little bit flirtatious, which I appreciated. You know, clearly he had excellent taste. <laughs> um, um, but one of my really powerful memories of him is um, we had a dinner shortly after recording the episodes for Versify. And the dinner was in the civil rights room of, um, of, the, of the main branch of the public library. And after that, uh, well, it was lunch, actually. So after the lunch was over, there was a bunch of food left. And he took the food um, to his church because his church did outreach programs for unhoused people. And just that act for me really made clear that his activism was lifelong and his activism was um was a practice that happened, whether the mic was on, whether the camera was on, he really did devote his entire life to um, trying to make the world a better place. So he was just, he was a really wonderful human being. I, I think about him often. You know, I, I love to hear that and thinking about this whole situation and how awful it was. But when Rip describes it, there's like this fondness in his voice. What do you make of that? Is that the magnanimity of his spirit you just described to us? Uh, you know, I think so. Um, we were kind of stunned during the interview, Joshua and I, because he was describing these really harrowing experiences. And we were just like, what? <laughs> like there was a moment during the interview where I was crying, um, but he was so composed. And I think that you know, I, I I hate to sound like a kooky poet, but I think that some people are just born for that kind of life and they have that that moral fiber that allows them to be able to resist and and still maintain a sense of wholeness. And he clearly had that. So, you know, maybe it was. I, I don't know. I still think about what it had to take, you know, at 19 and 20 to make these life-changing decisions, to risk life and limb, um, and and also risk their educations, which was a surprising thing I discovered during the interviews that they were expelled for their activism. Um, I, I don't know what it takes, but whatever it was, he had it. You know, not everyone was on board with these ideals of nonviolence. Dr. Freddie Leonard talked to local spoken word artist Saran Thompson about how it felt to endure such hatred without fighting back. It was it was like like, like being brainwashed. You know, I'd hate to say it that way, but but anytime you're you're taught not to defend yourself, that's that's difficult. I've seen people beaten, I mean severely beaten. How do you how do you stand by and watch that without being bothered inside? They got some kind of courage out of beating us because they knew we would not fight back. We had workshops, and the workshops sometimes would be real tense. Sometimes in the workshop, you want to fight. Mm -hmm. You know, like, man, you didn't have to throw me on the floor. Or, you know, and they say, well, that's what's going to happen to you when you go downtown to the lunch counter. Mm -hmm. You know, this is what's going to happen. So y'all would kind of act out yeah. some of the scenarios. Mm -hmm. That's what we did. Were there yeah. a lot of people that buckled under the pressure? Most people did. Mm -hmm. Most people did not 
Most people did not participate in the civil rights movement. Most black people didn't. Mm -hmm. They were not going for it. Most black people said, no, I am not going to be nonviolent. You beat me enough during slavery? Uh-uh, no. Mm -mm. I mean, it was a, a discipline that was, it was something. I mean, you know, just imagine you sitting next to a girl and hear this white man come and they put a cigarette light out, well, put a cigarette out on her. And when I came up, your mama told you, don't let anybody mess with your sister. Mm -hmm. It was like a rule. You don't mess with the women in the family. And then you in a situation where you see the women being snatched, pulled by the hair and dragged across the floor and kicked and spit on, you know, and, and then you tell them, the one who's doing this, I love you. You know, that's that, that's that indoctrination from those preachers, mm -hmm. you know, because they had us thinking that these, we're going to get to these people's hearts and we're going to, you know, we're going to make them realize that we are humans and we are their brothers and we love them and they will eventually love us. But that didn't happen. They changed the laws, but they didn't change their heart. Saran, welcome to the show, my friend. Um, that's, that's, a he that's heavy right there. Mm-hmm. Um, what Dr. Leonard was saying, how did you feel when with what he said in that interview? Being honest, it was actually a bit overwhelming. Um, I think when we compare how we're taught and how the civil rights era was kind of the perspective looking from the outside in, it's like, oh, okay, it's like watching a movie. But talking to him and him really being able to paint these vivid pictures and you being able to really step inside of that it's i mean it's arguably some of the most horrific stuff that i could imagine um and not even just what's happening to them from other people but that internal struggle and wrestle of okay well if i'm committed to this nonviolence, but it's literally fight or flight and i can't fight and i can't fly Mm -hmm. What am I supposed to do? So, you know, looking back at it, you kind of alluded to it the civil rights movement, where we love to really glorify the nonviolence um, as the only valid way to make that change. But Dr. Leonard points out that that is a lot to ask. Oh, 100%. 100%. I mean, when he was, there were so many stories um, that he was telling, and just thinking about even when they were on the bus. And then once the bus got raided and they escaped out a broken back window and they ended up running into a church service and hiding in the choir mm. while they were looking for them, you know, and just thinking about like everything that's happening. OK, well, you can't fight back because obviously if you fight back, you're you're probably going to die on the spot um, versus people that just get beaten and just torn up in that moment from that, from him um, doing the lunch counter sit-ins to um, the movie theater sit-ins and when he's talking about getting beat with a billy club, it's, I mean, it's horrendous. Um, and then as he's talking about kind of his later perspective and shift, I was kind of like, I'm not too mad at this. Mm. You know, um, I don't really know where I would align like in that moment because I can't fully say because I wasn't in it, but um, yeah. Yeah. His later, his later perspective made a lot more sense to me. You can see the perspective. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If you're just tuning in, this is Nashville, and I'm your host, Khalil A. Colonna. We're reflecting on Nashville's Freedom Riders with a few local poets who inter interviewed them for Nashville Public Radio's Versify podcast. So we find out from the podcast the Freedom Riders were not glorified in Nashville for many decades. In fact, far from it. The state of Tennessee actually created a law to punish students who took part in civil disobedience by allowing them to be expelled from state institutions if they were convicted of a crime in any state. When Dr. Etta Simpson Ray came home from Mississippi, she found out her mother had gotten a letter stating that Etta had been expelled from Tennessee A&I for being arrested as a freedom writer. Let's listen. I can remember that the area we were in, picture perfect. I have come into the room from outside and I was in the hallway. I can remember just her holding that letter in her hand standing in the hallway in our house. 
and she was crying because I had been put out of school. It just just hurt her that bad. I would have been the first kid to go to college. I still vividly can see her right now holding that paper and crying. It has never left my mind. How did he feel at that moment? That I had let her, da- let her and my daddy down. Mm-hmm. I had let her and daddy down. But it was like, it wasn't nothing I could do but just you stand there and it, she, it was just so overwhelming. I just couldn't, I couldn't say nothing. I couldn't move. I, I don't know how long we stood there. I can't even remember where I hugged her or whether I started crying. All I can remember is her in that hallway. I think it's easy to forget that the Freedom Riders weren't necessarily hailed as heroes right away. They faced heavy consequences. Joshua, what do you think? Why do you think it's important? Why do you think that is important for people to know? You know, I think that it's easy to kind of make mythic figures of people who do incredible things in their lifetime and to forget um, their humanity in the process and to really be grounded in the fact of like their reality that these were many of them teenagers. These were young people who had dreams and aspirations and who were mortgaging their entire futures with, if we're being honest, no certainty that the efforts that they were putting forward would bear any fruit. Um, and that the consequences they suffered were life-changing and that they are things that stay with them for their entire lives. Um, that, that bit of tape, that like moment in the interview with Miss Etta is one of the more haunting ones for me. Um, because this woman who has lived a full life, you know, who, even though an element of her trajectory was derailed, who has had a family and many grandchildren and something that is still so concrete for her is what she had to sacrifice so that, you know, we could even be in this room talking about her life Mm -hmm. Um, and that she had no idea that we would be. Um, Like, I think many of them had faith, but, um, you know, faith is the, what, the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So it it just, um, yeah, it really, I don't know, it, it really gets to me to think about, like, how much she gave up to, to make many of us possible. How much all of them gave up and the stories of people we haven't even heard of. Right. And what, what they survived, which is, when I look back at it, I'm like, it's, it's not that long before I was born, mm-hmm. you know? And so it's like conversations to have with my family members, with my parents, uh, with aunts and uncles about what did you go through and what did you sacrifice? Because... These were made at a time where public support was virtually non-existent and the resistance to the movement was widespread. Destiny, talk to me about how looking at the entirety of the movement as it actually happened, how is that, how does that help to give us clarity and perspective? You know, I think that's a good question that may be better answered by <laughs> people who are a little closer to the then than than I am to the now. Um, you know, I think that there's a lot we can learn about um, how organized they were, how undeterred they were, how deeply invested they were in um and community uplift, right? Like as Josh was saying, like the potential of sacrificing their own lives for, you know, the greater good of the people who were around them and the people who would come after them. I, I just, I think that those are things that sometimes get lost in like the shininess of, of, of the platform, of the stage. And, you know, I think, I think those are the things that, um, for me, like w- were so powerful to just be sitting next to and and hearing, you know, the life stories of. Um, so, yeah. You know, Dr. Ray also says she didn't talk about this for a long time. And her sister, who actually had to have emergency surgery after getting injured during a protest, still won't talk about it. Joshua, did you run into any reluctance when you were asking people to share their stories? You know, yes, honestly. Um, Initially, we wanted to interview as many of the the 14 students from Tennessee A&I as possible. Um, But there were some who 
um, you know, for whatever reason, uh, were, were either unable to or unwilling to to participate. And also elements of their stories where, like you heard in that moment, or I suppose maybe the tape ended just before, but Miss um, Etta, even when she was telling that story, she was like, that's as much as I can say mm. um, about that moment. And there, I do remember Dr. Patton himself saying that some of the Freedom Riders years later decided to, you know, go into therapy to work through some of the things, some of the trauma that almost certainly was like lingering with them emotionally um, and sometimes physically. Um, but that he personally, you know, he went to one session and he was like, I decided that I, I couldn't do any more because I thought it would unearth too much. So I think that for, for many of them, like their return to those spaces, one, it was like such a gift for them to be willing to relive what I think was often a very traumatic moment. But also I'm glad that you pointed to kind of like the levity because across the board, all all three, all four of them um, would have these moments of humor in telling these really dark stories, which I think is a hallmark of like black survival in terms of like being able to find joy in even the most difficult moments. But also it's that they were making lifelong connections as well, that there were moments of like intimacy and tenderness and joy among the students when they were in parchment prison, when they were singing through the walls to let each other know that they were still breathing, you know. Um, and even when you would see them interact today, there was still clearly that sense of connectedness and intimacy. So I think it's that when they return to that space, it's bounded, you know, they have to have a means by which they can enter and exit without being mm -hmm. pulled under. Saran, did you find those moments of light and joy in your interviews? Oh, a hundred percent. Dr. Leonard, he is hilarious. Um, there was the part I was talking about where he was saying that he was standing in line and, um, they basically would line up at the Tennessee theater and they would occupy the line so that this way the uh, white customers could not get to the ticket booth. And whenever police were called and they were told to move, they refused. Or they would go to the front, be told, hey, you can't get a ticket here, go to the back of the line, just keep doing it over and over. And so um, basically Dr. Leonard had a reputation for being kind of the hard-headed, stubborn person out of his group and <laughs> so he he alludes to the story about how basically he wasn't afraid of like the police in a billy club and he wasn't afraid of like standing up there and mm -hmm. um he ended up getting beat on the head and it kind of became like a a joke amongst them um you know but like a uh in a real way of a uh, significant way of downplaying what actually happened and what would be classified as a very traumatic experience, but it's something that you can still kind of find like that, that reprieve in that moment. So, you know, y'all conducted these interviews in the fall of 2019 then 2020 rolls around. I'm curious about this experience, like interviewing the Freedom Riders, learning about the activism of the civil rights movement in the sixties. And that happened 60 years ago. How did it affect how you perceived the aftermath of George Floyd's murder and the global protests. Destiny? Oh, I think I'm still processing those things, right? Like, I think that, um, I don't know. I feel like I, conducting these interviews makes me more hopeful. But then seeing acts of violence like the murder of George Floyd, like the murders of um, the customers at the Topps grocery store in Buffalo, I, I don't know how hopeful I am for an immediate future, you know? And a lot of that has to do with um, what's happening on Capitol Hill, what's happening in the Supreme Court. But I hold on to the memories of those interviews as proof that change is possible. Um, I just question how uh, how soon that change will come. So, and I, I'm thinking of the clip that you just played with um, Dr. Leonard talking about the laws being changed, but not the hearts. Mm -hmm. I feel like we are seeing that like on a global level right now. And, and sometimes that makes me a little less hopeful, but I hold on to um, the legacies of the Freedom Riders as proof that many things are possible. I don't know if many things are impending. Mm. 
Saran. Um, you know, towards the end of my interview, I had asked Dr. Leonard kind of what his perspective on things that were happening in today's time. And he kind of in a, in a surprising way was saying how he thinks the condition and the state of things in today's time is arguably worse mm. than what it was um, back then. And then, you know, just when you incorporate elements like social media, so from every small crime to every major world level crime, like you get blasted and embedded just either with the facts of what happened, you get op eds, you get um, people that basically try to mitigate it and make it seem as if it's not happening. And there's a lot that happens mentally for us internally, externally, um, in our household, our community. And it makes it hard to really grab onto something tangible. Uh, one of the biggest lessons I learned from Dr. Leonard was that, well, two things. So one is that the solution doesn't always arrive the way that you would envision it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the result that they were aiming for, it kind of manifested, but not necessarily in the way that they would anticipate it. Um, but also understanding that in order for us to achieve a better tomorrow for equality and equity um, and safety is that we're we're like a car and we all have our own roles to play. So some of us are the brakes, some of us are the engines, some of us are the blinkers, uh, the windshield wipers, something that may not feel super significant, but we do all have a role to play. And understanding that as long as we continue to put our energy and effort to move this vehicle forward, then we will achieve a bigger, better, brighter tomorrow for everyone. I want to say thank you to poet Saram Thompson, Destiny Bird song, and Joshua Moore. Really, thank you all for being here. Thank you. Thank you. You can listen back to the full season of Versify featuring the Nashville Freedom Riders and the poems their experience inspired at WPLN.org slash podcasts. We'll have a link for you in today's post at thisisnashville.org. We're taking a quick break, but when we come back, we will meet one activist who is at the heart of the civil rights movement in the 60s. And we want to hear from you. Do you have questions about our history with the movement? Do you have a story to share? Tweet us at This Is Nashville. We'll be right back. I'm Khalil E. Colonna, and this is Nashville. We've been reflecting this hour on the legendary le legacy of the Freedom Riders and their fight to end segregation. The fight for equality and the work didn't begin or end with the Freedom Rides. That's something my next guest knows very well. Professor Gloria McKissick is a lifelong educator and civil rights activist, and she joins me now. Professor McKissick, welcome to This Is Nashville. Thank you for being here. Professor McKissick, are you with us? Yes, I am. Thank you for inviting me on the program today. Oh, wonderful. It is an honor to have you with us now. You know, we just spent some time looking back at the Freedom Riders and what they were able to accomplish. You were a student at TSU at the time. Tell me, what do you remember about that moment in Nashville? Oh, um, well, back then it was uh, A&I uh, hadn't become the university uh, as yet. But I came to a&I, as a freshman, the same year that the Freedom Rides had taken place uh, that summer. In fact, that summer, I had been a, a debutante I'm from Detroit, Michigan. My background and experience is uh, quite different from those who uh, lived in the South and participated in the movement. When I came to Nashville, it was really a cultural shock, the things that I saw and experienced. Uh, um, I grew up in an integrated neighborhood, uh, into integrated schools, uh, when often I was only black in, in the class and always in the minority. And um, it, it was quite different uh, coming uh, south. But when I arrived, I was very naive about so many things. And I remember being in the student union and the Freedom Riders had been expelled from A&I. 
I knew little or nothing about that. I, uh, in fact, I'd been in the Ebony Magazine as a debutante when the Freedom Rides took took place. I All right. In, in another world, but it was the Freedom Riders who um, encouraged me to become a part of the movement when so many other students um, had backed away from that because no one wanted to be expelled uh, from school. And it was Freddie Leonard, in fact, who was one of the expelled Freedom Riders who came around to us and the student after student in the, in the union and was asking us, would we go downtown and participate in, in the sit-ins? And it was his encouragement and other Freedom Riders who recruited me into uh, the movement. And that day, I did participate in my first uh a sit-in. What was that like? Full, hmm? What was that like? What was what was it like at your first sit-in? Oh, it was unbelievable. We went downtown to First Baptist um, Capitol Hill, and unlike the Freedom Riders and so many others who had extensive training with Dr. Lawson, I had maybe fifteen minutes, mm. and he was there and others, but. Uh, I didn't know who they were at the time, and uh, they just told us how we behaved, how to behave. They gave us a set of rules and to be polite, and when they try to drag you out, just become a sack of potatoes, don't resist. We just got quick instructions, and we marched downtown silently. We were always silent and dignified, and we went to Wilson Quick. In fact, I have a famous uh, photograph of myself uh, at my first uh, sit-in a photographer took. But our leader was John Lewis, and it shows John leading us to Wilson Quick, which was on Church Street across from the theater. And we went uh, into Wilson Quick, which had a long lunch counter. And I, I need to say, too, there were very few of us, again, because the students had been expelled mm -hmm. and people didn't want to participate because of that. We went in and one by one, we were dragged out of that and tossed on the street. Uh, by then a crowd of people had gathered and was uh, making racial slurs and so forth. And I was one of the last ones. There's also photographs of that. Uh, that was dragged out of uh, Wilson Quick. Again, it was all kind of cultural shock to me. And I, I remember being fearful, probably for the first and only time, because somehow I um, became, um, oh, I don't know. I felt like we were on the right side and God was on our side. And I had a veil of protection, a wall of protection around me. The movement was religious. It was deeply religious. And they dragged me out of there. And I never will forget as they pulled me across that floor. They had asked, you know, us to leave. And we said very politely, we were not leaving. We wanted to be served. And they had soaked up the windows. The customers had left, and it was only the uh, the uh, uh, waitresses and um, what did they call them? Uh, bus boys who who were there. Those were the guys who swept up and took up trays and and all. Mm -hmm. And this woman at the counter said very sarcastically, "Don't hurt the little nigger." And for me, a little northern girl from Detroit who was not accustomed to white people talking to you that way. In fact, I grew up to somebody white says something like that. Uh, you beat them up. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we didn't tolerate that. Mm -hmm. And for her to say that to me, um, it, it just, it just made me feel so awful. I would just never forget that. And I think that's the moment I became committed to the movement. I said, this is a, this is a shame. This is a, the indignity of it all. And I was thrown out into onto church street, like a, like a sack of potatoes, like I was trash. Okay. So and, uh, you, you lived it this, was shocking. you lived this history and oh, then, yeah. and then you went on yeah. to teach this history. Tell me, why did you become a professor? 
Oh, well, the movement had a great impact upon my life. Um, I wanted to teach the truth. I wanted to tell about the movement. I wanted to teach black history uh, to to all the children, black and, and white. I just became interested in in, in telling the, the real story, the, the full story. In fact, as a teacher, I uh, became, in 1968, the year that they integrated the schools, um, I was fresh out of college and I taught in a newly integrated uh, school and that that was the experience uh, as well. Everyone had to get used to one another, the students and the faculty. And I have many stories about the integration of the schools and became part of the uh, committee uh, to help integrate the schools and make changes. Uh, um, I mm-hmm. taught the black history. I worked on curriculum guides uh, that in, that was inclusive of uh, our history, as well as women's history, minority history. And uh, I worked on textbook committees, a state textbook uh, committee in selecting uh, books for the schools and making sure that our story was in there, not just pictures, but we were part of the narrative. I just dedicated my life to trying to uh, tell the truth. So as an educator, having dedicated your life to this movement and telling the truth, how do you feel about how history is taught today? Well, they're trying to change history and it, it you know, and exclude those stories. Uh, it really disturbs me, the decisions that have been made about what is taught in the schools today. And it makes me feel like all my work and effort, you know, has gone down the drain because we're moving uh, backwards. Uh, uh, it's very disturbing. And um, we need to continue uh, and dedicate ourselves to making to make sure we're on the boards of education, that we are hiring teachers that are willing to tell the truth and take chances and maybe um, go against the law like we or the rule like we did back then. And and as Spike Lee said, do the right thing. Yes. Yes, ma'am. You know, I'm really thinking about the mass shooting at the Buffalo supermarket over the weekend. The 18 year old white suspect was targeting the black community. 10 people were killed because of the color of their skin. You know, every time this happens, it feels like here we go again. And let me ask you, Professor McKissick, are we really learning from history as a society? Are we stuck or are we stuck in this perverse loop? Uh, I don't know. Uh, to me, the the movement is not over. It's not over till it's over. And there will always be racists among us, just like uh, there's still Nazis among us, and we know what they did. Um, so the struggle continues, and we must continue to be activists. I really believe in activism, and I made that an intricate part of of my teaching that my informed organizations for students to learn how to uh, implement Martin Luther King's uh, philosophy of nonviolence was a part of my classwork and all the students knew the rules to conflict resolution and had to use them. Even if they wanted uh, to discuss with me their grade, they had to go through those uh, steps that Dr. King mm-hmm. uh, talked about being nonviolent. We have to teach, we have to educate. We have Professor Rick, is encourage people and not just act on their emotions. Yes. Mm -hmm. Really quick, 30 seconds left. You know, you've you've lived this. Tell us, we have so much to deal with as a society, as you pointed out, but what does the future look like in your eyes? It, (laughs) it looks dim. Um, it, It looks dim. And like I said, we have to continue to be activists and that's the only way that we can continue to move forward because there are those elements in our society uh, that are conservative and want to turn back the clock and we have to stop that. 
Professor Gloria McKissick was central to the civil rights movement in Nashville in the 60s. She has since dedicated her life to it. And as an activist and educator, Dr. McKissick, thank you so much for being on the show and sharing your story with us. I hope to have you back on soon to continue telling us stories. Oh, wonderful. I appreciate you. Fantastic. Okay, we want to thank everyone who tuned in this hour. A lot of people have been wondering, what's going on with Centennial Park at the Pavilion? Tomorrow, we'll find out. This is Nashville is a production of WPLN News and Nashville Public Radio. Listen back at thisisnashville.org or wherever you get your podcasts. Our producers are Steve Harouche, Rose Gilbert, and Tasha A.F. Lemley. Our digital lead is Anna Gallegos Cannon. Michaela Elias is our technical director. Our executive producer is Andrea Tuthope. The masterminds behind our theme music are Lorange and Namir Blade. Special, special, special thanks to Dr. Mary Jean Smith. Dr. Etta Marie Simpson, Ray King Hollins, and our news director, Emily Siner. Conversation doesn't end here. Tweet us at This Is Nashville. Find us on Facebook and Instagram and tell us what you want from our show by filling out our quick survey online. This is Nashville. I'm Khalil A. Colonna. We'll see you tomorrow, everybody. And be really good to each other.